Welcome to my talk, everybody. How to despaghetti your blueprints with science. So, a bit about myself. I'm Valentin. I'm the technical director at Hangar 13 Games. I've been in game dev now more than 15 years or so, I think. And my journey with Unreal started back in uh, 2015 with uh, Gears of War Ultimate Edition, which was like a remake of the very first Gears of War. And that was an interesting experience seeing like Unreal Engine 2, and we we're trying to port it to the back then new Unreal Engine 4. Uh, Hangar 13 Games, you might um, know us by the Mafia game series, but also we just released, if you, if you like tennis, we just released Top Spin 2K25, uh, so check that out. So what are we going to talk about today, right? So we're going to describe the problem, what is about these blueprints, what, how can we improve the situation. Uh, don't take any offense if you do like spaghetti, I, do, I like spaghetti, but in, in blueprints it's not that good, right? So we're going to look at the main, one of the main ways to solve this which is via validation, but then how. Uh, I'm going to show you some interesting uh, formulas how can, you can apply to measure the complexity of blueprints, starting with something easy, then moving into something more advanced, and then draw some conclusion at the end. Now, uh, I don't have that much code, but interestingly enough, all these formulas, that the, the stuff I'm going to show you, it's quite out there, it's open. So I'm hoping that you take some inspiration from what I'm going to show you. You get this, you search. Everything I'm going to show you is kind of very easily searchable, Googleable. So you can get some of these and implement them in your own stuff. So it's not like it's not rocket science. It's just about knowing the right stuff. Uh, so I, I hope it's quite uh, usable and you will get some good takeaways. The talk itself is not going to be too long, about 30 minutes. So we got, uh, should have some time for, for questions. I'm not going to bore you with too many math stuff. I do have one slide, which is like a ginormous graph. So you can sleep until then. And then I'm going to hit you with that graph. Right. So. Um, Complexity in Unreal, right? Complexity in Unreal can grow out of control in two main ways, let's say, two main axes. You can have this, the, the so-called spaghetti, because blueprints themselves, they're a visual language, and due to the nature of the, of the flow of that visual, stuff can get very uh, hard to, to understand or maintain. But also, uh, the asset references. By creating references between assets, you create chains of dependencies, and the longer these chains, you know, the more problems you, you will have. Uh, we're going to concentrate a, a bit more on the first part, but I'm going to touch a bit about the references and dependencies as well. Right, so everybody's favorite, the spaghetti monster, right? As you can see, due to the node based and the links in blueprints, they can get quite, quite uh, complicated quite fast, right? So everybody working with them, even yourself, maybe in a, after you write something in a couple of months, you return and you're like, what, what did I do here? So generally, you want to avoid some of this. And to, to further illustrate the point, maybe some of you know of this. There's the uh, Blueprints from Hell. There's an actual uh, website that, that kind of like a wall of shame of all these like huge spaghettis, right? Like, uh, so hopefully, what I'm going to teach you today it will allow you to never make this, uh, this website. Your spaghetti shouldn't be on Blueprints from Hell, right? But I also mentioned about the, the other side when I said that, that you can create the so-called dependency hell because when you create dependence, uh, you know, uh, references, direct references, especially the direct references uh, between assets, the longer these chains are, the more impact they have to, to loading, runtime performance. I'm sure you're all familiar with maybe a character class that grew out of control and then you click on it and it takes 10 minutes, worst case, to, to open in the editor. Um, so the, the, the example, the go-to example for this that I'm going to touch upon a bit is the casting, right? Maybe you know this already, but it's very easy to kind of overlook. If you, you can create a very easy direct dependency and relationship when you cast to blueprint types. So in this example, you see class B is directly referenced and it's forever linked now with class A because of this, this uh, cast. So every time A is open or accessed, B will also be open and accessed. And you can kind of see how this can go out of control. Here's a random example. You can find this. I just plucked it from, uh, from Google. You can see the size map of a blueprint. Uh, it's like overall is two gigs just because of these dependency chains that, that get created. And there's various ways to, to deal with this. So how would you go about uh, not creating some of this? How, you know, obviously, you want to create a good culture. You want to have reviews or the so-called body checks. You want to like teach new people the, the good ways. Obviously, you want to create documentation, tutorials, 
how to improve things. And uh, we all know we have time to refactor in game dev, right? But you should, you should still try. But what I want to touch upon in this talk is how do you prevent the problem before happening, let's say, or like catch it early, right? So they say best medicine is prevention. So then you should look into validation, data validation, right? So you catch it uh, earlier rather than later. So what is data validation? Well, data validation is a kind of what it says on the label is a plugin in Unreal that you can very easily um, enable. And pretty much it allows you to validate assets. Like the most straightforward way is to just right click on an asset and you do, you see, uh, validate asset. You can do this per asset, you can do it for folders, or you can actually write commandlets and validate everything in a project. So that's good. But uh, the real key here is you should insert this at the point where you submit in, the, uh, in your main line. So depending on the source control you use, either Git or Perforce, generally in game dev you use Perforce, right? You want to modify a bit the engine, so this validation to run on the uh, assets that are part of a change list. So speaking Perforce language, when you're about to submit something, you submit it via change list, so you want to run these validators on the change list. So if, there's, if the validators come back and say there's a problem, it, it actually doesn't go into submission. It will force the user to reconsider and fix. So that's a good way to catch at the source. Here's a very quick example. What is a validator? Pretty much it's very simple. You can do it in C++. You can do it in Python, I think, uh, and Blueprints. At the core of it, too small. Um, Functions can validate, like you check the type and what type of asset you want to operate, uh, and the meat of it, which is validate asset implementation. In this case, you see it um, goes over some actors, verifies they're not editor only. So you can kind of take this as an example and, and use it as inspiration to write new validators. But so how do you leverage this, this uh, data validation? Even before that, I, I, uh, I urge you to do something that I saw Epic themselves do, even before you go into the submission and validation, try to cook with warning as errors. So you stop dead at the first um, problem rather than start accruing you know, more and more warnings and then you have hundreds and hundreds of them. So that would be the very, very first line of defense. And then the next line of defense would be validation. So I showed you that BP cast. What about maybe disallowing uh, certain nodes? So you, we, for example, disallow. Uh, casting to blueprint types. You disallow get all actors. You disallow things that you observe that maybe are problematic. And remember the asset chains, you can maybe walk that chain, and if, you, if it's longer than a specific limit, you report back to the user. So large dependency chain or like cyclic dependencies. And what I'm going to show you a bit about the uh, complexity of a blueprint. So the key idea here, you do a validator that measures the blueprint, categorizes the spaghetti and tells the user, I'm sorry, this is too complex now. You cannot submit it. It would be too dangerous. And then more and more validators. Here's a quick example here. So we have like, I don't know, 50 or something. So you can do bespoke validators. Does this mesh have collision? Does it have enough tr triangles for nanite or so on and so forth? So you can do very small bespoke validators. Try to do them as a problem arises. Don't let them uh, you know, don't write validators toward the end of a project. It's good to write them as the need arises for, for validators. Let's take a quick case study. Again, uh, the Blueprint node. So I want to go in Blueprints and, you know, maybe um, inspect something and, and deal with it. So luckily, Unreal has a very nice API. You can kind of just get all the graphs. You can get all the nodes from a graph you can run various operations. So here, very simple, gets the graph, gets the node, enumerates them. If there's a problem with the node, you see there's a, there's a validation error. So this is kind of the outcome. Uh, there's a blueprint with two problematic nodes that we said. And upon validation, you see it will spit an error saying disallowed class, disallowed type of casting. And I'm going to show you this a bit uh, later. It's good to also don't leave the user hanging, like offer some sort of like documentation or what to do in the case of a, of a problem like this. So here's a, a bit like an example from, the, um, from an INI, from the settings. So 
you want to offer a fuller system when you do this validation. So um, maybe it's not visible, but it's very a couple of, of couple of parts. You have at the top the actual nodes you want to validate against, right? So it's data driven. Then you have a couple of documentation links, and as everything in life, you want to offer some exceptions, right? Uh, maybe if someone's paying you high enough, their blueprint is good and it will always uh, go to validation. So in our example, if uh, there's a regex there saying that the, all the functional tests are exempt from this uh, validation, right? Because they don't go into runtime. There's, they're a different beast, let's say, right? So against my will, some, somehow someone convinced me to, to, to add the exceptions there. But it's still a, a, powerful, a powerful mechanism. Right, so what about the the meat of the bones, right? How would you write a validator for blueprints? How would you reason about, like, you see it visually that it's, like, complex. How would you try to, to teach the validator that that's the case? So let's look at some classic complexity measures out there in the software engineering field. So we're going to look at cyclomatic, the thing called cyclomatic complexity, and we're going to look at a thing called Halstead complexity. So it turns out that in the 70s, back way in the 70s, when software was at the beginning, it was already too complex back then to, to get out of control. So people, some researchers back then were looking into this. So there's a guy called Thomas McCabe, which in 76, he introduced this concept of um, uh, cyclomatic complexity in the attempt to measure complexity of flow graphs, right? Because back then, uh, you know, you had your flow graphs and uh, programs were generally uh, described in terms of graphs. So if you have a graph, there's some, I, I pasted there from Wikipedia. You see, you can go and research it after. Um, there's a formula to, to get the complexity. But the, the heuristic is number of linear independent paths in a program. So programs with lower cyclomatic complexity, they're easier to understand and less risky to modify. So you're looking for lower numbers in this cyclomatic. So here's a quick example. You have a source code, a simple function the main uh, flow into the function will be one. Then you have two if statements, two switches that like kind of divert the flow. So in total, you would have a complexity of three. That's your complexity for such a simple um, example. You can find this, some, some of you might be familiar with this, you can find it in various uh, static analysis tools. The Visual Studio does this cyclic com uh, cyclomatic complexity. So how would you do this in Arial? Well, luckily, the visual scripting, the, the blueprints, are a graph. So you could, theoretically, for every event node, you just increment complexity for every output, right? For connected nodes, the same. You just in increment for your output, apart from the first one, because you want to maintain the default execution path, right? The main kind of line of entry in your blueprint. So let's look at an example, right? There's an event. It just goes through some nodes. That's one. Then you have another event, begin play. You have a branching, you know, but the branching can be invalid. That's the second path, the second linear independent path. The cast can fail, that's the third. The getter can also fail, that's the fourth. And you, so on and so forth. So you can see that counting like this, you get the complexity of six. Here's another example. Uh, you begin at, the, at that node, one, but the switch, you see, it it's the, has the one main path. The, the select, uh, the two selects that maintain the primary path, and then for every other option, you add complexity. So in the end, you would get a complexity of six. So that w was our first attempt after we discovered this formula to measure complexity. But you can see that it's kind of weird, like three, four nodes, and it's like six complexity, seems a bit too much. So we revised the formula. We looked into a bit of a different uh, heuristic to measure. So we now measure exactly kind of like they say the the de facto branching, like how many true independent paths. So you kind of count your input for each input uh, pin, the output pin, right? Again, with the rule that you subtract one when uh, uh, you know you want to maintain the main unique path. All this is good, but let's. I think it's better to see see an example. So. We start with the main path going into that sequence, right? Then we diverge, that's the second path, the return node. And then we have another switch. But as you notice now, right, uh, all those links, the output links are dead, so they don't count anymore. And the two that actually have output, they go both into the, the return node. 
So in the end, you have only three. So with the previous algorithm, if you just blindly count the outputs, you would get seven. But with this more refined one, you would get uh, three. So I think this is already a better uh, calculation because it matches better, right? This is not a super complex graph. So it deserves three more than seven. Okay, so you have like a, a complex graph. How would you improve generally the cyclomatic? How would you get lower cyclomatic numbers? Well, you have to kind of arrange the graph and, and cut the number of, of independent parts that it takes, right? So here's a crude example. You don't need to go into detail, but, uh, but visually, hopefully, you see less parts, less cyclomatic, easier to understand because I don't need to branch mentally. Oh, what is it doing now? Oh, what is it doing now? So try to, to combine. OK, so that's, that's one measure, right? That's cyclomatic. Let's look at another one the so-called Halstead. This, again, in the 70s, invented by someone called Maurice uh, Halstead. And it's an interesting method to, again, try to determine the effort, the difficulty of understanding a, a program and maintaining it. The same deal, the lower you would have the effort, the simpler the program would be to change and maintain. And it's interesting because when uh, he was trying to introduce it, he tried to find an uh, analogy with um, properties of matter right, like volume, mass, pressure, and the relationship between them, like similar to the, say, gas equation. So he tried to uh, mimic this with pro properties and relationship of software. Very simple example, again, you will find this, I shamelessly copied it from Wikipedia, but just to kind of get a simple understanding, you start at isolating number of operators and operands. How many unique, how many in total, you would get the so-called vocabulary and length. And then you see there's a couple of formula that the, the guy was thinking, the volume, the difficulty, the effort. There's also an interesting one, like a uh, number of estimated bugs that it, you can plug in. And there's this formula, but we didn't, we didn't bother with this. So we just, you'll see the, the effort and difficulty and volume are the one that you're mostly interested in. Quick example. So uh, again, uh, from Wikipedia, it's, uh, let's take a stereotypical C++ or C example. You have a couple of variables. You read from the command line. You average them. And then you, um, you, know, you print them out. So what are the operators? Uh, would be your main function, the, the syntactic sugar of like the curly braces and all that stuff, the, the actual functions, um, and so on. The operators would be you know, the, the variable names the text that you actually feed to the functions, uh, the number three, right? These are operators. So again, you plug kind of this in in this semi-magical formula, right? And you get a volume of 178. You get a difficulty of 12, and you get an effort of 2,000. Now, in the, I'll show you later what these how these numbers can grow. But generally, you can you know lower difficulty, 12, vo semi-low volume. So it can kind of already show you that this is not so difficult to maintain program, right? So it's an interesting heuristic to kind of match the, the, your understanding. So how do you do this in Arial? Well, very simple. What are the operators? You just literally count the number of uh, nodes. So we'd have one, two, three, four nodes, right? And then the operators would be what, what these nodes are processing. So you see this takes a variable. That's the first operand. Uh, the branch takes a condition. That's the second. The destroy actor has a variable like target. Uh, that would be the third, right? Here's a, another quick example. I have a couple of nodes here. Interestingly enough, you see there's four nodes, but only three are unique because the, the branch repeats itself. Very simple. You plug it in. You get an effort of 78, a difficulty of 3, and a volume of 20. So again, it uh, kind of matches right intuitively. Very simple graph, difficulty 3. OK, so we saw cyclomatic, we saw Halstead. The same with how would you improve it? So you have uh, a bit of a hairy situation. How do, you, how do you get better numbers, better Halstead volume? Well, it's quite easy. You have to collapse down, try to, to reduce the, the actual volume of the graph. So you do it in you know, collapsing down to macros, collapsing down to function, extracting into function libraries. You know, it's the usual refactor, best practices. Um, anything that you kind of uh, learn from other talks is, is very valuable here. 
But in this case, at least we have now numbers, we have some heuristic to tell us if this effort of improving it is paying. Okay, so cyclomatic and Halstead, right? Um, what are the observations so far? So you, like I said, you can take this, quickly plug the formulas from Wikipedia or whatever, and you can run uh, and calculate your, your um, uh, blueprints. Um, they kind of correlate with each other apart from the Halstead volume is logarithmical and the cyclomatic complexity, as you would imagine, is linear. So it's uh, comparing linearly, actually, when you have a bunch of blueprints and you want to get an understanding is not that good because the differences are, are small between small values, but you know, there's a big difference between 1, 10, 100, 1K, 5K when it grows exponentially. We are not the first one to have this problem, interestingly enough. So there's another paper, there's another effort uh, in the early 90s by someone called Oman and Hagemeister. They were trying to find a better approximation of this, like a one value indicator for the maintainability of a software system. And they, it's literally called maintainability index. And interestingly enough, it's a weighted composition of that Halstead volume I was showing you, the cyclomatic complexity, the number of lines of code, and interestingly enough, a number of comments. This uh, is again present in static analysis, interestingly enough. Uh, Visual Studio uses it, and they kind of adapted the formula, uh, making it like normalized between 1 and 100, because the, the original formula is kind of unbounded. So just to kind of give you a bit of intuition, the original formula was saying, if you have everything bigger than 85, that's kind of highly maintainable. Whereas Visual Studio, you see, compresses down to the 0, 10, 20 ranges. Uh, whereas we, because it's a validator, because we really just want to say spaghetti, no spaghetti. So we just cut it straight up and uh, we plug the formula in such a way, anything lower than 30 is not good for us. But you can obviously play with your, uh, with your data and, and um, understand what's best for you. So, a bit of a warning, especially epilepsy. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some data that we, we ran. Right? So this is the mother of all graphs that you can obtain. So let's say you put all these formulas in, and you try to reason about your data to try to, to, to see where the lines are. So this is a normalized graph based on the maintainability. And if you can, and the, the big squiggly yellow, that's the Halstead. So as you can see, kind of going from the left side, when you have high volume, right, and so-so common percent and other metrics, uh, maintainability is low, right? But then as the volume drops, also maintainability goes up, right? There's some interesting gap there, you see, where uh, there's the construction script. You know, those are generally empty, so then maintainability plateaus. And the thing that I'm going to show you, and then it goes way lower, you see, like at the very edge, that's empty graphs. So an empty graph would be perfect maintainability. Uh, you will see that an interesting um, exception. You see, if you have a higher number of comments, you're a maintainability and so-so difficulty, you can kind of bump up the maintainability. So you, I'll talk about this later. Um, the commenting is like a savior. It's, you can kind of push, if, nothing, if you cannot do anything else, you know, at least add some comments and that will make your, your um, maintainability higher. Uh, although there's some exception, you see, highly commented, that dot there, highly commented, but, um, um, you know, kind of complex. Uh, but still, so I encourage you to run these type of analysis on your own code base, and then try to reason and make your own judgment. And, and a, another quick one, for us, over 500 blueprints, as the complexity and the node count vary so much, uh, you can see that maintainability kind of tries to stabilize itself, right? Uh, that's how we kind of came up with that threshold of, of 30. All right. So what were some findings so far after, after we went and applied this? Because it doesn't take too long, to be honest with you. These formulas are relatively easy to kind of put in uh, in a validator. Um, so we really had um, a success with maintainability right because it allows this kind of redeeming because it incorporates in the formula the number of comments it allows them to redeem themselves right it's an easy way to kind of uh, 
if nothing else, to, to save that blueprint. Um, they correlate, like I show you strongly, with the inverse of the other metrics. Uh, thus reconcile the differences between, because if you just think in terms of volume, density, effort, it's kind of hard to, to understand. Maybe the volume one is a bit better to, to kind of wrap your mind around, but otherwise it's hard to understand. So, so you can kind of make sense of all this with maintainability index. So for us, the overall spaghetti factor is the maintainability index. What else we found, right? So when people are pushed to kind of, you know, your blueprint is, is problematic, how are people fixing it? Well, you know, they're, uh, they're just taking advantage of the system, they're gamifying the system, and they're, um, you know, <laughs> luckily we don't have that many, uh, that many instances. People are actually actively trying to, um, to repair their, their stuff. Also, I'm not sure, uh, this is a funny example, I don't, I'm not sure why two delay nodes right after the other, but whatever. Um, right, so here's our thresholds. So in our code base, you have to have, so your blueprint, when you, the validator kind of runs through your blueprint and you get, have you seen in that message log, you get the output, it will actually tell you, uh, you know, volume this, maintainability that. So we have, it needs to be bigger than 30, no more than 120 nodes, the volume needs to be smaller than uh, 3,500, no more than 40 cyclomatic. 40 cyclomatic is relatively high, right? It means 40 different paths. Uh, and we require at least 5% comment, uh, obviously only if you have more than 19 nodes. But also an interesting uh, thing, if you run statistics, if you don't do anything else, you just kind of run statistics, try to incorporate per force. Because sometimes, like the per force age, when was the last modify, let's say. Because sometimes it's okay to have low maintainability, um, complex stuff, if it's seldomly modified. But you wanna, f you wanna find what uh, blueprints are very often modified, but also with low um, maintainability. Right. Like I said, it's not enough to just kind of, here's the numbers, here's the thing. You, you have to put in a bit more effort. You want to write some documentation, right? Because people will be like, the first time you implement this is like, half that volume is low. And you're like, uh, what? So you need, to, you need to write a bit of documentation, teach people what to do in case they, when they see these weird kind of things telling them your cyclomatic complexity is high, right? And you have a mission designer and you're like, what are you trying to tell me? So you need to... You need to have a bit of uh, documentation and, and teach the team how to respond to these things. You can also integrate it. We use Horde uh, CI, uh, and you can very easily integrate reporting. So as time passes, you kind of report on all these uh, blueprints you have. It's a very simple command let, you know, for all blueprints, just run the validation and it will, uh, the same logic, and it will, it will spit out numbers for you. Right, so let's look at some real case examples out there. Let's see how uh, a blueprint, I'm gonna show you the blueprint, I'm gonna show you the, the scoring for it, so we see some, uh, if it makes sense. Let's start with the worst blueprint you can find in Unreal Engine, which is the, it's unfair to call it like that, but still, it's the control graph of the, uh, it's the rigging graph of the control rig, right? It's so bad, like Unreal kind of has problems to draw it, it's so bad, cyclomatic complexity is zero, so there's a bug. We didn't even look into this, I'm not sure why it's zero. And you can see maintainability is an abysmal three, right? Because it has a thousand nodes with only 6% comments and has 47,000 Halstead volume, all right? So you can already, you see the ginormous number, 47,000, you can already get a direct correlation that this is a massive blueprint. Here's a, a bit better example from our code base. This is a generic character base, some debugging. A more respectable 32 maintainability. The node is one node away from disaster, so we have the limit 120, this is 119. A respectable 6.7% comment. Cyclomatic complexity not that big, you see, nine. So there's not that many paths, actually. It's, you can kind of understand it, you see. There's, it branches off and you can understand. And the volume is so, so way smaller, right, just uh, 2,600. A bit better one, just to kind of get, uh, for you guys to get an understanding, better maintainability at 39, a bit lower uh, node count, way better um, comment percent at 14, cyclomatic 28, but very respectable um, 1,200 
volume, the half-step volume. And one of the best you, you can see already, right? This, just without the numbers, it looks better. It's like commented, has some colors, nice linear paths. You can see cyclomatic 18, so it, you can reason about it. Note count, not that much. 18% comment, you rarely find such high number of comments. And a very low volume of 800, which means that people took care to collapse down into functions. It kind of looks big, but it's not big, right? It doesn't have volume. It doesn't have a uh, two, if you remember the formula, that means it doesn't have a lot of those operands. So that's a very good uh, maintainability index. For us, 48 is quite good, like even very simple ones uh, will get like around 50. So I hope this kind of gives you a, a, a cool idea of like what you can uh, what you can use, how you can marry these tools, the, the intuitive understanding with actual numbers. Right, so we're almost near the end. So as a conclusion, uh, validation, impact, and complexity. So validation, very invaluable workflow for us, and I recommend it. Allow us to, to keep the mainline branch uh, to safely evolve. You want to put these right uh, things in, in, in place. So your, as the project progresses, it, it progresses a bit in, in a safe matter, right? You're sure that you're not going to create too much tech debt. But like I said, try to have it as a pre-submit mandatory validation, because if you, like I'm telling you guys now, right? Oh, you should use Cyclomatic, right? People, you go out there in the world and adoption is not that amazing, right? So you want to just, for lack of better word, force it. <laughs> Um, the biggest impact was this, but also the I didn't I didn't talk about it. It's a whole nother talk in itself. Validators that detect the, the hidden dependencies, those dependency chains, how long they are, right? Um, especially this complexity is good to maybe integrate immediately after pre-production once you, you your stuff gets mature, um, and constant push for validators. Problem validator, problem validator, right? Try to get ahead. Um, of the curve. So complexity, the, this way to measure with the maintainability index and the, the related things, uh, a success, but obviously it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it's like one of the first lines of defense. You still need to do refactor. It won't save you for anything runtime related, right? But it's still good there as the, uh, as the first line, right? And one maybe disadvantage of it is that uh, after a while, like we notice some of these, like especially a, a very high modified blueprint, it just kind of tends to stabilize at the threshold. So they're like one or two nodes away from disaster or like the volume, you know, so that's, that's something to look at, right, with, um, with the reporting. So, uh, yeah, that was quite, quite fast. Maybe I went too fast, but that, that's kind of it. Thank you very much.